Welcome back. Question 11. Determine the colour of a solution with a pH of 9.6 containing bromocrystal green indicator. Let's remember that pH 9.6. Let's go to the data book. Acid-base indicators are given to you. There are seven with the pKa values, their pH ranges, their colours and so on, all given to you. Bromocrystal green has a range of 3.8 to 5.4. Clearly, the 9.6 is way, way above 5.4, and therefore you will see a blue color. Just making sure you understand indicators, at any pH below 3.8, or 3.8 and below, the indicator will be yellow. At any pH of 5.4 and above, it will be blue. And in between these two values, the changeover will be taking place. So when it gets to about maybe 4.5, something like that, what color do you think you might see? Hopefully you said green and you were correct. Question number 12. We have to name this molecule according to UPAC rules, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry rules. You don't need to know that. You just need to be able to use the rules. Okay, so what have we got? Well, we've got a one, two, three, four, five carbon unit. It's got a double bond, so that makes it a pentene. The double bond is attached to the second carbon. Okay, going from this end, it would be the third. So we're going to go from the end, which gives the lower number. So that means it's going to be pentuene, or as QCA tend to prefer, two pentene. Pentuene is more accurate, but they do tend to put the number in front. So it's pentuene. Now we've got two pent, two pentenes, two, two pentenes. We've got the cis and the trans isomers. This one has the hydrogens on the same side of the double bond, and that, of course, makes it the cis isomer, whereas the trans would have been the hydrogens on opposite sides of the double bond. Question 13, we have a titration curve. We can see that it starts at a low pH of 1. That means it's a strong acid. And it finishes at a pH of about 13, which means it's a strong base as well. That means there's quite a long vertical section, which means there's a big pH change at the equivalence point. Now then, point 1 obviously is at the start of the reaction. Point two is approaching the equivalence point or the end point when the indicator changes color. Point three is just before that equivalence point and point four is the equivalence point. And what we're asked to identify is the equivalence point, which of course is this point here. If you're ever asked to work out the pH and you're just given that vertical or you're given this titration curve, put a little line across the vertical bit and take the midpoint of that line and read across. They will allow you a small margin of error, but try and do it as accurately as you possibly can. Ammonia gas reacts with oxygen gas in the following equilibrium, equilibrium expression. This is bread and butter chemistry, guys. If you can't get this right, then I don't know what to say. Just remember products go on the top reactants go on the bottom. That is the convention that we have accepted and use. Any numbers that are used for balancing, the stoichiometry if you like, become powers in the equilibrium expression. And square brackets are used to indicate concentration in moles per liter. So we're going to have N2 squared times H2O to the power of 6 over NH3 to the power of 4 times O2 concentration to the power of 3 cubed, and that is D. Question 15. This compound is an unsaturated fatty acid because it contains A. Well, unsaturated means there's a double bond present, and carboxylic acid obviously makes it into a, fat, a fatty acid. The only difference between a carboxylic acid and a fatty acid is the length of the hydrocarbon chain. A long chain like this is present in fats or lipids or triglycerides, 
and they called fatty acids. But a fatty acid is simply a long hydrocarbon chain carboxylic acid. So the double bond is the unsaturated bit and the carboxylic acid is the fatty acid. Question 16 shows, now let's have a look what's happening. We have a nitrile that contains a C triple bond N. We are adding two moles of hydrogen, which will fully saturate those two atoms to create CH2, NH2. We have turned a nitrile into an amine. It, it uses a nickel catalyst, and this could be an addition reaction because we're adding hydrogen. But another definition of the addition of hydrogen is reduction. And therefore, B is our choice. It's a reduction reaction, converting a nitrile to an amine. Which the following represents a spontaneous redox reaction with a correct standard electrode potential. My advice when you do in a question like this is find the two half equations in the electrochemical series. Let's just quickly go back up to that. Find the two half equations in that series. Then see if it will indeed be anti-clockwise, because if it's not anti-clockwise, then you're off to a very bad start. This wants the, uh, a spontaneous redox reaction, so it needs to be an anti-clockwise direction for the two half cells. This one is clearly going to be wrong. Na plus 2 Na is going the wrong way. Na plus 2 Na is going that way, and therefore that would be a clockwise. That isn't going to work at all. Um, looking down the list, I'm kind of putting my cards on C. Zinc to zinc 2 plus would be, where are we? Minus 0.76 in the forward direction, but we are reversing that. That would become plus 0.76. And then that is combined with chlorine chloride. So this going that way would be plus 0.76. Chlorine chloride is plus 1.36. And together, they will give you 2.12 volts. If you don't believe me, check the other ones, guys, and you'll find they're not going to work. Solution A has a pH of 3 and the solution B has a pH of 6. Now, the pH scale, of course, is a log scale. The lower the number, the higher the H plus concentration because pH is the negative log of the H plus concentration. A difference of 3 units means a difference of 10 to the 3, which is a 1,000 times. So is it this one or this one? It's definitely one of those two. Now, the pH 3 is a lower value, therefore it's more acidic, and it has a thousand times the concentration of the hydrogen ions in solution B. Dispersion forces, hydrogen bonding, disulfide bridges, and ionic bonding all contribute to. Well, we've got all the four possible structures of the proteins here. Let's quickly refresh our memories. The primary structure is simply the sequence of the amino acids. Simple as that. The secondary structure is where the chain of amino acids is going to turn into either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. If you can't remember what they look like, go and look at your notes. Those are held together by hydrogen bonds. The tertiary structure is where the secondary structure, the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet, or a combination of both, fold further on themselves and attract through maybe more hydrogen bonds or maybe just simple dispersion forces. Or you can get sulfur-sulfur covalent bonds called disulfide bridges. You can even get ions in different amino acids linking together through plus and minus interactions. Clearly, C is the correct answer, and D is simply a combination of several tertiary structures to give a very complex protein called a quaternary structure. Uh, hemoglobin, for example, is a quaternary. DNA polymerizes a quaternary, but the tertiaries are by far the most um, common. 
most of our enzymes, our muscles, our organs, our skin, hair, nails, antibodies, you name it, enzymes. Did I say enzymes already? I'm saying it again because they are very important. Um, they're all tertiary structures. And finally, question 20. Now, clearly, this time, the electrochemical cell in question is a galvanic cell. We have two separate containers. We have silver dipping into silver ions and copper dipping into copper ions. They have also very kindly shown us the silver ions are turning into silver and the copper is turning into copper ions. What that means is this is the one that's producing the electrons. And the electrons will then travel through the voltmeter, registering the EMF between the two, and then into this half cell where silver ions grab them and deposit silver on that rod. Copper will be the anode, the negative electrode. Silver will be the cathode, the positive electrode. Ions will travel through the salt bridge. Um, if obviously uh, copper ions have been produced in this beaker, then nitrate ions will travel into this beaker to keep the balance of positive and negative ions the same. In this beaker, positive ions have been removed. Therefore, potassium ions will travel into this beaker again to keep the balance of plus and minus. Which one do we go, are we going to choose then? So the copper ions are reduced. That's nonsense. Copper is the positive electrode. It's not. It's the negative. Electrons flow through a salt bridge. Electrons can never, ever travel through a salt bridge. Only ions can travel through a salt bridge. Electrons can only travel through wires or the non-metal graphite. Please, please, please do not think electrons can travel through anything else. They can't. Oxidation occurs on the surface of the copper. We've already said copper is the anode. Electrons are lost there, and electron loss, of course, is oxidation. Guys, I hope that's helped you. I hope that makes a lot more sense. I will be making more videos. The next ones I'm going to make are papers one and two of the externals, and then I'll follow that up with some sample papers from maybe QCAA or maybe other boards or maybe companies that produce them, but there'll be more videos coming.